This is a lecture about gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, particularly as they apply to deep learning and machine learning. So first we'll introduce gradient descent and then we'll talk about convergence properties of it under uh, convexity assumptions. And then we'll talk about stochastic gradient descent and then analyze uh, its behavior. So we will think about optimization and machine learning and here we'll accept the, the standard framework where we may have some data that is a set of xi, yi, and this is from a supervised uh, learning framework. We're trying to learn some model, which is, in this case, we'll call it y hat. This model depends on some parameters theta, and for some input xi, it outputs some value y hat. The goal of many common uh, algorithms for training, um, systems in machine learning, is to find the best parameters theta that uh, agree with the data. And so we do a minimization over theta of the sum over all of the data points of the loss of the predicted uh, response at the input of the ith data point uh, compared to the observed response of the ith data point. And here the loss function could be L2 loss or could be cross entropy loss, uh, depending on the exact context or it could be other things. In order to uh, solve this optimization problem, we're going to abstract it and talk a bit about optimization in general. So here we're interested in optimizing some function, which will say uh, minimize over x some function f of x. So in the machine learning framework here, x really is the set of parameters of the neural network, which uh, we've before called theta. Uh, but to be consistent with the mathematical optimization literature, we'll just call this x. So one key idea for doing this optimization is uh, the idea of gradient descent. And this comes to the idea of taking successive steps downhill. So if we view our function f of x as a surface uh, in, in, say, like three-dimensional space, uh, for, say, two-dimensional x, then we might get uh, uh, some, uh, some surface that looks like uh, this shape here. Okay? So the idea would be I'm going to start at some point, and then I'm going to say which way is downhill. I'm then going to follow that downhill all the way until I get to uh, the uh, minimizer. Right? So mathematically, what that corresponds to is, let's say, at the, the ith iterate, uh, I have some value xi, and then I'm going to ask what is the direction of steepest descent of this function f, and that will be the direction negative grad f of xi. So if, for example, I'm at this point, then the direction of steepest descent will be here. Uh, if I am here, then the direction of steepest descent will be there. And so then my update to, the, uh, to my current position xi will be some constant alpha times this direction negative grad f of steepest descent. This constant alpha is something which we might call step size or you might call a learning rate. Uh, in the deep learning community, it's generally called a learning rate. But in the optimization, the mathematical optimization community, it's often called a step size. And here, this gives a formula for the i plus first iterate uh, relative to the ith iterate. Now, I want to point out, like in this figure, there, there's two visualizations of the function um, being optimized. One is the surface, which plots in z the values that f takes. The other are these level sets, like these closed uh, contours here shown on the bottom. And those are all the set of inputs x1, x2 that have the same uh, value of f of x. And it's quite often easiest for us to consider the behavior of you know, optimization algorithms by uh, visualizing them in terms of the level sets as opposed to the, the function surfaces. Right, so to give a, depiction, a depiction of a gradient descent, let's do this. Let's look at the level sets of some basic quadratic function uh, here shown by these ellipses. Right? And the way gradient descent will work is you start at some point, 
you compute where is the gradient, so that will be something that points, or actually it's something that might point in this direction. You then march a step in that direction, you get a new point, you reevaluate the gradient, in this case that gradient points this way, we march and then we get this point, and then we repeat this point all the way until hopefully we get convergence. Uh, and in this case, uh, we see that we can have some, you know, jumping around, uh, you know, we might, you might say that we've like overshot and we've overshot a little bit less and then we overshot successively less until we converge uh, to this um, minimum value. So we can ask, how does the learning rate qualitatively affect the behavior of a gradient descent algorithm? And here there's uh, you know, many things that can happen, but here are some, some categories. So the first observation is that if the learning rate is too big, then this can cause divergence of the gradient descent algorithm. Uh, so visually, let's say I'm at here, I've changed back to plotting like the surface view. So here the, the function f of x is plotted versus x, and that function is this gray curve here. Then uh, we might start our gradient descent at some initial value. We, we ask, well, what is the gradient here? And so that's something that points uh, to the right because, well, the derivative is negative, and so the negative of the derivative is positive, which is rightward. And so then we march some step over here. So then here we see the gradient uh, is, or the derivative is positive, and so hence the negative uh, gradient would be negative, and so then we might actually step uh, back over here. Uh, and then it's actually possible for gradient descent to diverge because each of these points then has a steeper gradient, which then causes even more of an overcorrection. Uh, so this is one failure mode of, of gradient descent. Uh, another is that you can run gradient descent and actually miss the optimizer. Uh, that could happen for the following reason. For example, uh, the learning rate might be too big that you miss a, a local uh, well. Uh, in this case, let's, let's consider this objective function. And we might start with a point here. We do a gradient descent step. We go downhill. We get this point. So here we go downhill. That's done by going right. But if we stepped too far, we might actually move to the other side. Uh, and then we can evaluate and take a gradient step. And we could go back. And we could actually get stuck in this um, you know, endless back and forth on either sides of this not realizing that there's this whole region down here of smaller objective values. So then uh, another thing that could happen qualitatively is we could set the learning rate to be really, really small. And then we take these tiny steps, uh, always like in this case, always to the right. And then eventually we do get into this little uh, well over here and then take steps down to, uh, down to the minimizer. So here we see like too small of a learning rate could, uh, could ultimately take a very long time to converge. So this, this naturally leads us to the question of how fast does gradient descent converge? Uh, and then just to set this up you know, in a framework, right? so we want to minimize f of x over x. And here f is you know, some function from rd to r. We do gradient descent, so we update uh, xi to some i plus first value by the negative gradient of f uh, with some learning rate alpha. And let's suppose that xi does indeed converge to some value, and then we can call that x star, uh, which, which should be the, the, at least a, a minimizer of this function, maybe a local minimizer, if not a global minimizer. And what we want to ask is like, how long do we need to wait in order to get a certain accuracy epsilon of our you know, solution to the optimization problem? Now it's hard to answer this in, in full generality, but we can gain some understanding by looking at convex functions f. And so now let's introduce uh, some terminologies just so that we can set up some uh, rigorous theorems uh, for the convergence rates. And so we'll say that some function f, which goes from rd to r, we'll call this function convex. If the function always lies below uh, its uh, 
secant lines. So what that means is that I could take some point x uh, and some point uh, y, and then here I have some function f, you know, which evaluated these points as f of x and f of y. Then if I query a linear combination of f of x and f of y, then that is going to be uh, above the value of f evaluated the linear combination of x and y. So mathematically, what that is to say is f of alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y is um, always less than uh, the, the corresponding linear combination uh, alpha f of x plus 1 minus alpha f of y. And so here, what this says is that the function lies below the line uh, connecting uh, f of x to f of y. Right? So this equation needs to hold only for alpha between 0 and 1 and for all x and y. In some qualitative sense, what convexity means is that the function kind of always curves up. Now, it could curve up uh, a lot or it could curve up uh, not at all by having, uh, by having, say, like a linear behavior, but in a sense, it's never like curving down. An alternative characterization of convexity uh, in the case where f is uh, twice differentiable, we could say that f is convex if the, the second derivative of f uh, is a positive semi-definite matrix everywhere. Right, so here, we'll remember that if we, if we have some function f from rd into r, Right, the first derivative of that, that's the gradient of f, so that is a vector of uh, the partial derivatives of f with respect to xi for every i. So then the second uh, derivative of f is then a matrix, because for each of those uh, first derivatives, another derivative with all of the components is taken. This um, matrix is something called the Hessian and is usually denoted with the letter h. Uh, and so mathematically, this is just the matrix of uh, second, uh, all the second order derivatives of x with respect to all of the xi's. Now, as a, as a matrix, we know this has a certain structure, like this is a symmetric matrix, uh, because the order in which you compute the second derivatives uh, don't matter. Uh, and because it's a symmetric matrix, what that means is that there is uh, an eigenvalue decomposition uh, and all of the eigenvalues are real. And so we have some extra terminology. We could say that this matrix, this Hessian, is positive definite if all the eigenvalues are positive, and we could say that it's positive semi-definite if all of the eigenvalues are non-negative. And so that allows positive values and uh, zero values. Now back to our uh, interpretation, like a function is convex, if its second derivative, if its Hessian, is positive semi-definite everywhere. That is to say, in all directions, it either curves up or actually like, has no curvature at all. So this is similar to in uh, uh, single variable functions where uh, a function would be convex if its second derivative is not less than zero. So we can now ask the question of, you know, what can we prove about when gradient descent converges? Uh, and we'll look at this first in a special case of quadratic functions. So let's give ourselves a quadratic function. So let's say we have some f of x, which is uh, some quadratic form plus some linear term. So this quadratic form is uh, 1 half x transpose qx, where q is some uh, d by d matrix, uh, and then we'll subtract some term that's linear in uh, linear in x, so that'll be a b transpose x. And here, x is in rd, we should think of this as a column vector, b is in rd, we should also think of that as a column vector, and q is, we'll assume, a positive definite matrix. So that again means that all of the eigenvalues are, non, are, are, are strictly positive. Now for terminology, we'll call uh, we'll call little m the smallest eigenvalue of q and capital M the largest eigenvalue of q. And then we'll introduce this 
uh, term uh, kappa, which is capital M over little m, and that is the condition number of uh, the matrix Q. Now, gradient descent with fixed step size alpha, what that corresponds to is writing, uh, so the, the, the recurrence that the k plus first iterate is equal to the kth iterate minus alpha times grad f evaluated at the kth iterate. Now we can say, right, so here we want to prove convergence. And so that means we um, might want to begin by asking like, is there a solution to this, uh, to the minimization problem, you know, of minimizing f? And indeed there is, uh, that solution is given by x star is equal to q inverse b. And this is the unique global minimum uh, minimizer of f. Right. The reason that uh, Q is invertible is because all of its eigenvalues are strictly positive, uh, and so then you can easily write down the inverse in terms of an eigenvalue decomposition. All right, now we can state a uh, recovery theorem, or a, a convergence theorem. All right, so this says, uh, if we are running gradient descent on a quadratic objective, and Q has... Uh, biggest eigenvalue capital M, smallest eigenvalue little m, but are both bigger than zero. If we choose the step size appropriately, so alpha here is two over big M plus little m, then we can get convergence of the iterates of gradient descent to x star. So here specifically we see that the L2 norm of the distance between the, the kth iterate and the global minimizer x star is some constant raised to the power k uh, times the initial L2 norm of how far away did we start. So it's natural to see that if we started further away, it would, uh, we, it would take us uh, more steps in order to get close. Uh, and then we also know that this constant is less than one. After all, uh, kappa was some number uh, bigger than one and so then this is some uh, number just smaller than one, this is some number just bigger than one, and so hence this whole, this whole expression is smaller than one. So this is uh, a geometrically decaying error rate. Now, uh, the terminology in the field for this is that uh, gradient descent in this case would exhibit first order convergence, uh, which is to say that the error rate of the kth iterate to the true solution goes like some constant raised to the k where that constant is less than one. Uh, but back to our question, which was how many iterations do we need in order to get error epsilon? Well, in this case, we need roughly log of one over epsilon iterations. And that comes from the exponential convergence. Now we can, uh, we can, prove, this, uh, we can prove this result we uh, begin by taking the gradient of f, uh, and we can compute this, and this is equal to qx minus b. So if we wanted to know where is the global minimizer, well, that's going to solve qx minus b equals 0. So we could write that as qx star equals b, and then solve for x star is equal to q minus b, because q, uh, uh, q inverse is, um, is, well, exists because q is invertible. Uh, then what we want to do is provide a bound on xk plus 1 minus x star, so let's write that out. Then we can expand xk plus 1 in terms of the gradient descent update rule. Uh, then we can expand, uh, well, what is grad f of xk? Uh, well, we actually computed that up here, so we can plug that in. Uh, then we can Remember that b is equal to qx star, so we can plug that in. Uh, now we can collect the terms, so it is this matrix here acting on this vector, xk minus x star, and then we can now start putting uh, bounds on this term. All right, so this, uh, this equality holds, so we can then say that the L2 norm of xk plus 1 minus x star is less than the matrix norm or the operator norm of this matrix i minus alpha q uh, times the l2 norm of xk minus x star. 
So what is the operator norm of this matrix, I minus alpha Q? Well, because this matrix is uh, symmetric, after all, I is symmetric and Q is symmetric by assumption, then this, uh, this uh, norm is the largest eigenvalue. Right? So that largest eigenvalue is either 1 minus alpha little m or uh, alpha m minus 1. I think it's important to remember it's actually it's not just the largest eigenvalue it's the largest absolute value of an eigenvalue so if capital M is very big then this matrix here its largest eigenvalue in absolute value will be alpha M uh, minus 1 uh, even though its largest eigenvalue uh, in its largest like positive eigenvalue would be 1 minus alpha M alpha little M So once we have this bound, then we could choose alpha to be 2 over capital M plus little m, and then that means that this uh, operator norm of I minus alpha Q, which again was the largest absolute value of the eigenvalue of this matrix, would be uh, capital M minus little m over capital M plus m, uh, and that we can rewrite as 1 minus 1 over kappa divided by 1 plus 1 over kappa, and we know that that is less than 1. So this then allows us to conclude that the L2 norm of xk plus 1 minus x star is less than this term times the L2 norm of xk minus x star. And now we can chain these together. Each uh, iteration, we get one extra multiple of this term. And so what that means is that the kth iteration uh, has k multiples of this term times the initial value. And that follows by a process of induction. And so what we've proven is that the error rate between the kth iterate and the global optimum uh, decays exponentially, which is to say we have first order convergence in the case of a quadratic function. Now we can interpret this, right? That interpretation is that if f is quadratic and it doesn't curve up too much, and it doesn't curve up too little, then gradient descent with fixed step size uh, will exhibit first order convergence to the global minimizer. Right? So the important things here are if f curves up too much, then the gradient steps might actually overshoot and we get the divergence behavior that we uh, mentioned before. If f curved up too little, for example, by like not curving up at all, uh, then we might not even have uh, a, a unique global minimizer to this problem. And so then we wouldn't expect a convergence to that global minimizer itself. So, so far that sounds good, that, that in the case of quadratic functions, we get first order convergence. Unfortunately, in general, that is an overly optimistic uh, scenario. And in reality, we often don't get as uh, strong uh, of, a, of a behavior, right? And the, uh, the reason for that uh, is because we often don't have, uh, we don't, well, we don't meet the conditions of having a quadratic function that has curvature bounded uh, both uh, above and below. So in order to state a more general uh, convergence result for gradient descent, we're going to study the case of strongly smooth functions f. We'll say that a function f is m strongly smooth if this inequality holds. And this inequality is that the difference between f of y and f of x is uh, less than or equal to the dot product of y minus x times the gradient of f evaluated at x plus m over 2 times the L2 norm squared of y minus x. Now, visually, what that corresponds to, let's say here is this curve of f of y uh, versus the y-axis. And then at some value, let's say this value is the value x, and so this here, the function takes the value f of x. So for f to be m strongly smooth, this says that this function is no bigger than this quadratic 
which agrees with the value and the slope of f at this point and has curvature uh, given by capital M. So what's going on here is we're saying that this, uh, this, this quadratic, that uh, you can find a quadratic that is always above the function f and tangent to it at, at this value x uh, for, for any x and for any y. So in a certain sense, what this is saying is that the function f doesn't actually grow too quickly. Right? If it grew too quickly, it would then surpass uh, this hyperbola that we, that we drew, or the, this parabola that we drew. Right? Equivalently, we can say f is m strongly smooth if the gradient of f of x and the gradient of f of y are, differ by no more than constant m times the L2 norm of x minus y. And we could say that this is calling grad f uh, to be m Lipschitz. So in what that is saying is that the, the rate of change of grad f is controlled. So in some sense, that's like saying the second derivative of f uh, is controlled, which is uh, what m strongly smoothness means. It means that the function doesn't curve up too fast. It doesn't have second derivative more than capital M. So we can state a, a, a theorem. So if M is convex and M strongly smooth, then if we choose our alpha correctly, uh, then gradient descent satisfies the following uh, the, the following. Uh, rate of convergence. And so uh, f of x at the ith iteration differs from f of x star. Here x star is a minimizer of f. The difference between these uh, behaves like 1 over the iteration number i. So it's 1 over 2i alpha times the square of the L2 norm of the initialization x naught minus x star. So here, what we see from this theorem uh, is that if alpha is chosen appropriately, then the decay rate of the error is actually quite slow. And so the error decays slowly. To get a sense of that, if we wanted to get error epsilon from the optimal value of f, then what we would need is on the order of 1 over epsilon iterations. And this is much larger than the story before where we needed log epsilon iterations. So here we see that in this case where we only assume convexity and M strong smoothness, then we get a, a very slow guarantee for the convergence of gradient descent. Now the other thing to note from this theorem is that uh, the assumption for what step size we need to take. So here the step size alpha or the learning rate alpha there should be less than 1 over capital M. So what that means is that if I have a very steeply growing function, so if I have a larger capital M for M strong smoothness, then I need a smaller alpha. And so this is like what we saw before. If the function grows too much, then or grows too fast, then I need to have a smaller alpha, otherwise I might uh, diverge. So we can write down the, the, the proof of this. So we're interested in studying the difference between uh, f of k plus 1, uh, f of x at the k plus first iterate, and um, f of x star right here. And so sometimes I use the the, the symbol i, and sometimes I use the symbol k. Um, but either case, they both mean the, the iteration count. Uh, so, so we're interested in this difference here, but what we'll first study is the difference between f of x k plus 1 and f of x k. So how far does f change on successive iterates? And this is going to allow us to argue that uh, the function always decreases in values. So we're always you know, not going uphill. So in order to 
uh, assert that, we want to expand these, we can write out f of x k plus 1 in terms of, you know, its, its definition, right? So x k plus 1, remember that that is x k plus, uh, you know, alpha grad f at x k. And here is a k missing. Um, and so what we what we have is that, that f of xk plus 1 minus f of xk is less than uh, the dot product of xk plus 1 minus xk dotted with grad f of xk and then plus capital M over 2 times the L2 norm squared of xk plus 1 minus xk. And this came from the m strong smoothness of f. Oh. Now we can plug in well, what is uh, what is xk plus 1 relative to xk? Well, that is uh, alpha grad f of xk. So this term here is really alpha times grad f of xk squared uh, with appropriately with the minus sign. Uh, then this term here also turns into basically alpha times grad f of k, but they're both squared. So then we can collect these terms uh, and consolidate these constants on the, the left side. And then uh, remember that we're choosing alpha to be smaller than uh, 1 over m. Right? So because alpha is smaller than 1 over m, then this expression is uh, bigger than 1 half, which means that this whole thing is less than uh alpha minus alpha over 2. Okay. All right, so what have we done so far? We've shown that f at the kth iterate minus, uh, or f at the k plus first iterate minus f at the kth iterate is less than this negative quantity depending on alpha and the square of the gradient. So what this means is that f is always decreasing according to our gradient descent. So that is good. Now we'll remember that by convexity, uh, we have this property that f of xk minus f of x star is less than or equal to uh, xk minus x star dotted with grad f of xk. And this is just the definition of convexity. So we can now uh, write out, uh, let's evaluate what is f of xk plus 1. Right, so this is less than f of xk minus alpha over 2 grad squared of, or, or an L2 norm squared of grad f of xk. That followed by this uh, inequality up there. Uh, then we're going to use convexity to expand this term uh, into these two terms. And then we're going to do an algebraic trick, which we're going to write this exact combination of terms as the difference of these two squares. So if you took these and then uh, foiled out uh, this, this difference of squares, uh, then you will uh, get exactly these terms up here. Uh, and so then, and then finally, we then interpreted this term as x k plus 1. Um, minus x star. Okay. So what we have is that now f of xk plus 1 is less than f of x star plus some term times this difference of the error at the kth step minus the error at the k plus first step. And this is going to allow us to write up a telescoping series. So remember that what we're interested in is the difference between f of xk and f of x star. And because f is always decreasing, we can write f of xk is always no bigger than the average of f of xj's for all of the j's from 1 to k. And so then we can subtract f of x star. We can now bring f of x star into this summation um, and then uh, we can write that this is less than 1 over 2k alpha times the, uh, the square of the L2 norm of x0 minus x star minus the square of the L2 norm of xk minus x star 
and this is by applying by applying these uh, in a telescoping manner. Right, so each of the negative terms, this minus uh, xk plus 1, will cancel the plus xk for the next index of k. Uh, and that leaves us uh, 1 at the start and 1 at the finish. Uh, and so then this is all less than 1 over 2k alpha times the L2 known squared of x naught minus x star. So what we've shown is that in the case of uh, a strong convexity, if we have uh, if, if we have a sufficiently small step size, then we will get a convergent algorithm to uh, a minimizer of the convex function. Uh, however, the guarantee uh, is only that the convergence uh, is relatively slow; it goes like uh, one over k for the iteration count k. Now we can think of the challenges in in gradient descent, uh, in running gradient descent in deep learning. Right, so we'll remember that what we're interested in is optimization problems of the following form. We want to minimize over theta, usually the sum or the average of the loss of some uh, predictor uh, y hat, which depends on parameters theta, evaluated at data, uh, xi, uh, and the loss is computed relative to responses yi. So this, this entire term we might call uh, f of theta in order to put in our framework for optimization. And we're going to run, uh, if we were to run gradient descent, then we would be evaluating theta at the k plus first iterate is theta at the kth iterate minus alpha times grad f of theta. And if we were to truly do this, then this would be theta k minus alpha 1 over n, the sum over all of the n data points of the grad with respect to theta of L of y hat sub theta of xi yi. The point here is that to evaluate grad f of theta, we need to do a loop over all of the data as per this summation. And if we're going to do this, this is something that we would call batch gradient descent. And typically, this is not normally used uh, because it's expensive. Right? In order to compute every uh, update, you know, every tiny update of theta, we need to sum over all of the training data. So this is expensive. But it also might not be possible. Uh, in some contexts, for example, in online learning, the data that you have access to you comes into a, a, in the form of a stream, uh, and which is not necessarily permanently stored anywhere. And so then if you, if you required seeing all of the data that you've ever uh, been exposed to, then that might not be possible, uh, even if it were computationally tractable. So in order to deal with uh, the expensiveness of uh, batch gradient descent, uh, a recent, you know, a, well, an approach is to use uh, mini batches, and here this is to say select a, a mini batch B, which is a subset of uh, one through n, so a subset of your n data points, and then update your theta by uh, the gradient computed over B. So instead of doing minus alpha. Uh, and this gradient over the sum over n, you'll do it over the sum of the items in B. So here, 1 over the number of items in the set B times the sum over all i that are in this mini batch B, uh, and then again, the, the, grad, the grad of the loss with respect to theta. So here, this uh, term really is used as an approximation for uh, grad f of theta, and it on involves only a few uh, a few of the data points that are being used for training. So this, uh, this framework seems like uh, potentially a good idea. Uh, if the mini batch is chosen randomly, then we could say that on average, the gradient of the mini batch is equal to the full gradient. And that seems like a good property. And this is going to lead us to talking about stochastic gradient descent.
So what I want to do now is put stochastic gradient descent on, uh, like in a in a formal framework, uh, so that we can you know understand it in a bit of generality, perhaps a little more than we may need for uh, for deep learning. But so in stochastic gradient descent, we want to solve the minimum over x of f of x. In this context, instead of having access to grad f of x, which we would need if we were doing gradient descent, we are supposing that we only have access to some capital G of x, which is a random variable, which on average or in expectation is equal to grad f of x. Right, so with plain gradient, with plain gradient descent, we have f, we can compute grad f, and we want to minimize f. Now we have an f, but we can't compute the gradient of f. All we can compute is some g, which on average is the gradient of f. So in stochastic gradient descent, we're going to write our uh, updates, you know, our updates of our iterations as you know, xk plus 1 is going to be xk minus alpha k g of xk. Here I'm writing alpha k because, as uh, being k dependent because uh, in general the learning rate um, could depend on which iteration uh, we are in in the training process, and typically it will. So once we write this, uh, this form, we can make a few comments. Right? On average, we know that we're moving in the direction of steepest descent, so generally speaking, we should be going downhill. Uh, but we can also say that uh, we may, in fact, move further away from the minimizer sometimes. And even if we started at the minimizer, the randomness in G could actually move us away from the minimum value itself. So there, there are a couple of um, you know, examples which we could use to reason about this. For example, we could say, uh, suppose G of X is the true gradient plus some noise. And so this, on average, is indeed grad f of x, but it has you know, some additional variance. And let's say that variance is sigma squared uh, in this case. Uh, or in a less simple model are the mini batches, which we mentioned before, which is instead of uh, computing the full gradient to this n term sum of losses, we're going to compute the gradient as an average value over some mini batch b of those losses for some randomly selected subset b. And in fact, B could be a subset of one item. It could just be uh, one randomly chosen data point uh, leading to G. Now, qualitatively, uh, the behavior of stochastic gradient descent you know, is as follows. Like, if we have a fixed step size alpha, then the iterations xk are going to move closer to x star, or, or they're going to move close to x star uh, but they're going to bounce around within some ball due to stochasticity. And so this is the trade-off that we make for having stochastic estimates of the gradient, is that we tend to move close to x star, but because of the randomness, we will never actually reach x star. And we can see this like borne out in an experiment. Uh, here is the plot of the error at the kth iterate versus the global optimizer, a sort of, of a simple optimization problem solved by stochastic gradient descent. And uh, the horizontal axis here is iteration number. The vertical axis is the error at, the, at that kth iteration. And here, what's being plotted is that error for a small learning rate alpha and for a large learning rate alpha also held fixed over the optimization uh, uh, iterations. So what we see is that with a large alpha, we get fast initial convergence, and then after this point, the solution bounces around. Right, so it, uh, this is to say it typically doesn't get all that much closer to the minimizer uh, than like these values here. Of course, there happen to be times where it might actually be quite close uh, to the minimum value, but then immediately it jumps out of that because of the stochasticity in the next gradient estimate. Uh, so, so overall, we get uh, with large alpha, 
we get fast initial convergence and large error relative to the minimizer. If instead we chose small alpha, then we would have a slow initial convergence, but the actual value where it terminates to is closer and has smaller error to the, um, to the minimizer. Right, so this is the behavior that we typically observe with stochastic gradient descent. Again, uh, large step sizes leads to fast initial convergence, but lar a large ball around which you're bouncing for the uh, relative to the global optimizer, and small alpha leads to small initial convergence or slow initial convergence, but better error uh, overall. So we can formalize these observations into a theory, uh, and this will be our analysis of stochastic gradient descent. So we'll need to introduce some terminology. So we'll again consider a convex function f from rd into r, and we're supposing that we have access to some uh, capital G, which is in expectation equal to the gradient of f at x. So then we'll say that the stochastic gradient is mb bounded if the expectation of the L2 norm squared of g of x is less than m squared times the L2 norm squared of x minus x star plus uh, b squared. And here x star is a minimizer uh, of f. Uh, to, to illustrate this, let's uh, look at a couple of examples. I suppose, uh, at, suppose g of x actually were grad f of x. So there was no stochasticity at all. Uh, if m was m strongly smooth, then g is m zero bounded. So in some sense, this first term is really about like strong smoothness. Uh, if we have the, the additive Gaussian noise variation of this, so if g of x is the true gradient plus some noise uh, with variance sigma squared in all of the components, then uh, one can compute the expectation of the squared L2 norm of g of x is grad f of x squared in L2 plus the expectation of the L2 norm squared of w. Uh, and by uh, if m is m strongly smooth, then this, uh, re remember we had a, a comment that m strong smoothness was equivalent to m Lipschitzness of grad f. Uh, and so we could show that g is m root d sigma bounded. So the root d sigma comes from the expectation of the square norm here. Here there are uh, d terms that all have a variance sigma squared. So in order to state a, uh, a theorem for stochastic gradient descent, then we need, one, we need to introduce one more idea that of f being m strongly convex. And so we'll say f is m strongly convex if this function f here can be bounded below by a parabola of a controlled curvature. Right? Or formally, we say that f of y is bigger than or equal to f of x minus the dot product of y minus x with grad f of x plus little m over 2 times the L2 norm squared of y minus x. And again, this means that uh, there's a parabola that agrees with the function and its derivative uh, and has some non-zero curvature uh, little m and that our function is always above this parabola. So in some certain sense, what this means is that f doesn't curve up too little. So we can then state uh, uh, a theorem for the behavior of stochastic gradient descent. So if f is little m strongly convex, and if g is m b bounded, and we choose alpha sufficiently small, so between 0 and little m over big m squared, then we can say the expected squared L2 error between the kth iterate and x star uh, is controlled by two terms. So one is the kth power of some term times the squared uh, 
distance between x0, the initial iterate, and x star. Uh, and then the second term is uh, a set of constants that don't depend on k. They just depend on alpha, b, little m, and big M. And so if we looked at just this first term, right, this first term looks like first order convergence. So this uh, quantity we need to argue under this assumption is indeed uh, between 0 and 1. Uh, and once we show that, then we can see that if we just had this first term, we would be getting first order convergence. So that's great. That explains the initial behavior of, like, of convergence. And for larger values of, a, or of alpha, we get faster convergence rates by looking at this term here. Uh, however, the, there isn't first order convergence because the, stochastic, the stochasticity means that it could bounce around in, in, in a region around uh, the global optimizer x star, and that region is given here. So if alpha is bigger, then this re region is bigger. And so if alpha is bigger, the convergence was faster, but the error relative to the true solution uh, is bigger. Right? So we, we see that uh, a couple of things from this theorem, that for constant alpha, we do not expect convergence. Right? That is because uh, of this term here, this never goes to zero with respect to k. Uh, and we also see that smaller alpha brings us closer to x star by minimizing the size of this region, um, but with slower convergence rates by looking at this term, or these initial convergence rates. So the last thing we want to do is to talk about uh, you know, how to choose step sizes and learning rates. And the ideas that we have before suggest a, a general principle. Right? If, especially if we're running stochastic gradient descent, if we just had a constant fixed uh, step size or learning rate, then we don't expect to have convergent behavior. Uh, now we could say, well, why don't we just have a lower uh, step size and we could do that but then we would have slower convergence so we can get the best of both of these by initially running at a large value of alpha uh, for a while uh, and then we could shrink the learning rate and then repeat so you run rerun for a while at that learning rate and then shrink the learning rate and repeat again uh, alternatively, we could have a, a specific schedule for alpha k uh, as a function of k, and this schedule could decrease in k. Like, for example, one could choose something like uh, 1 over k. And uh, in these cases, with stochastic gradient descent, it is reasonable to hope for convergence of the uh, optimization algorithm. So there are some challenges with gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent in deep learning. And one of the major challenges is non-convexity and non-smoothness. So we can see from, from this figure, uh, which shows the loss surfaces uh, you, under ResNet, you know, both with and without skip connections, uh, for the training of, of the neural net. Uh, and what we can see is, you know, for some of the, particularly in the case of, of no skip connections, that there's a lot of non-convexity here, and there's a lot of non-smoothness, right? There's a lot of like rapid oscillations of these functions. The second derivatives, if you will, are very high at some regions. Uh, and so that means that our, you know, our, our theory for the behavior of gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent doesn't, uh, doesn't really apply. Right? So this could lead us to, uh, multiple issues. For example, we could get stuck in local minima. Uh, and if that were the case, then what we might want to do is actually temporarily increase our learning rate uh, to get unstuck. And there we may even be leveraging the stochasticity of the gradient estimates to actually get us out of certain uh, local wells. Uh, we can also pay attention to how the architectures of our neural network change the loss landscape 
uh, as they do in this paper where they show that uh, with skip connections, the lost landscape is much smoother. And so hence that can be uh, much easier to actually have the optimization succeed on uh, potentially because you could take larger step sizes. So the summary from today's lecture uh, is, is as follows. I mean, we're really paying attention to gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, and the effect of learning rates. And so if the learning rate is too large, then that can lead to divergence of gradient descent. And here, largeness is relative to sort of the degree of convexity, the degree of curvature of the function. You know, in, in a convex case, uh, to get convergence, alpha should be small relative to this uh, amount of curvature. Uh, however, uh, too small of a learning rate can be problematic because it can lead to very slow convergence. And so we have theory in the convex case that for convex quadratic functions, gradient descent can be, be very fast to converge in a first order level, but for more general convex functions, uh, convergence is typically slower uh, and can be as slow as you know, 1 over k, uh, where k is the iteration count. So then finally, a stochastic gradient descent with fixed step size is not expected to converge. That's because the stochasticity and the gradient estimate means that even if you were at the global optimum, you get knocked off of it and into some ball around the, the global optimizer. Uh, but with decaying step sizes, then you may uh, be able to converge uh, with stochastic gradient descent. Uh, 